Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this broadcast, and my name is Chris Shea. Uh, you can find me over at lifesjourneyblog.com, and I'm an author and counselor, life coach, and I do uh, video chats and podcasts, and you can find that on all of your normal podcast uh, devices, and that is called On Finding Peace. And I'm very pleased to be here uh, with Ben uh, Rolnick, so welcome. Great to have you. Hey, it's great to be here. <laughs> so we're uh, we're doing this cross country, huh? Yes, we are. We are. You're um, you're on Maryland, and I'm in sunny LA. Yes, yes. It is uh, already pretty dark over here, and uh, we're kind of watching the hurricane moving up the coast. So we'll see what all that produces. Wow. So, uh, by the way. This this is so totally random. I just want to dive right into it. So I'm uh, I'm born Jewish and um, raised Jewish and I'm in every sense ecumenical. I don't know if you could tell by my beard, but <laughs> I probably could have been a rabbi in another life. But with my long hair, maybe not quite. So uh, or maybe in a scene or something like that. And essentially, I'm a huge fan of Jolos. Great, great stuff. Uh, very wise. Yes. And uh, and I know like he he charges some people. Not everyone's into it. And just the idea of like a religious leader makes people kind of bristle up. But I find him to be one of the most compelling, loving speakers. Like anytime I'm feeling sad mm -hmm. or I want to decompress or I just want to find myself an experience of peace, I listen to Joel and I just know <laughs> I'm going to get some positivity exactly. that courses through my veins and excites me and elevates me. And the, last night, he was telling a biblical story about uh, the story of Jonah. And essentially, I, I don't know too much about the Bible, but ah, the hurricane yes. thing sparked me. And I'm so curious to just kind of start this because essentially what Jonah said, Jonah was on a boat with a group of people. This is how I remember it. And essentially what happens is there's a great storm that's coming. And Jonah says, this storm is probably coming because there's something inside of me that is unrectified, that I was you know, born to be this spiritual person and I'm not living and fulfilling out my destiny. And so he's saying that essentially this is causing a storm on all of you. And what ends up happening is the people on the yeah. boat <laughs> throw them off. <laughs> They're like, well, if that's the case, then fuck you. <laughs> Goodbye. So I'm sorry if I, I don't watch my language. Uh, and, uh, and so they throw them off and sure enough, the storm subsides, it's over. And uh, it did come from this welling up in his heart. And what Joel was saying is that how often do essentially the things that we leave undone and those parts of ourselves that are unfulfilled, not just affect us, but also right. affect everyone else around us. And when you talk about a hurricane, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is how mm. are neighbors helping neighbors? How are people showing up in order to not just protect themselves and what they love, right. but to protect their communities and the people around them? And how much less scary would it be if you knew that there was a support system and you knew that people would be there for your aid? And, no and that would be happened. so wonderful, you know, and, and, and I do believe that when people come together, that's what makes the world a difference. And for me, the only sad part about what you've said is people do come together during these times, but then once it's over, they scatter. It's like you have these tragedies happen and everybody pours out and they're all there to help you. And, you know, and that's what's going to happen. But then where are they in just everyday life? Where, where does that community run to when the hurricane is over and things are cleaned up and everybody's, you know, living their lives? Where'd they all go? Mm-hmm. Gives me the chills. I think that's been one of the most potent things for me in my life and a problem that I've always wanted to solve because 
essentially the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing today is I had so many experiences in these breakthrough transformational moments, or even right now it's Rosh Hashanah in the Jewish tradition, it's the new year and going to temple and being basically force fed through this system that I didn't want to participate in with people who were about as, you know, <laughs> touched <laughs> by the Holy spirit <laughs> as they were by their paycheck. And essentially they just, uh, they, they provided no juice for me. But one of the things that I did get was it was the one time of year mm. that I got together with friends and family and everyone exactly. had a little bit deeper of a conversation that would basically dissolve and disintegrate as soon as you know the moment ended. And I thought to myself, well, if we're having these breakthrough experiences, how do we keep ourselves on that ride as opposed to just being dropped off in the corners of our life to fall back into the patterns of inertia that most yeah. people are- no, and, and that's so very true, you know, and and that's where, you know, when big tragedies happen, everybody goes back to their faith communities. They all help each other. Everybody starts reading the Bible, quoting the Bible, all that great stuff. But you're right. Once that's over, then where did they go? You know, and and I think it is that. Hmm. I, I I just think we're we're so geared right now into taking care of ourselves in a selfish way that that we forget about everybody else because we're so busy doing what it is that we're doing, and we get so involved in that doing, and, and we justify hmm. it. You know, I, I've got to spend time with family. I've got to be at work to pay the bills. I got to do this. I got to do that. And then we start justifying all the stuff we got to do. I'll bet if you sit back and really figure it out, yeah. you don't have to do most of that stuff. Well, the irony is that you're saying that it's selfish. And in some mm. ways, I find it to be self-punishment. Because... The heart right. is the most selfish organ of the body. It takes all the fresh blood <laughs> for itself first. And if it didn't, right. it couldn't feed all the rest of the organs and the whole system was shut down. And what I, I think if we acted more like the heart in our lives and we acted more selfishly, we probably would take more yeah. space and time for yeah. ourselves and we'd slow down. <laughs> And I'm looking over, I'm sitting here with Grace and she's not looking at me yet. But the thing is, is that, yeah. is that I'm guilty of that more than anybody. I never slow down. I just want to keep going faster and yeah. faster. And, and but it's I actually do look not at, being you know, selfish. It's being there are those stupid. times when we need to take care of ourselves, you know, <laughs> and, and do what we need to do for us so we can be helping other people. And then to me, there's that selfish time when we're really not doing it for ourselves. We're, we're just doing it because we think we're doing it for ourselves. And, you know, like I say, it is, it's just justifying what it is that we're doing, you know? And, and, and I, I like what you, uh, how you put that in, in that self punishment in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Well, we need to be more heart. We, we need to pump that life into society. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it is so much more rewarding. Have you ever heard the study of the Good Samaritan? Yeah. It's yeah. one of my favorites. And I think it speaks so beautifully to what you're saying. Is that here's a moment where, I mean, this is our life. Like we're right. so, most of us are so busy. We're so caught up in the race in order to get ahead and one step ahead of ourselves and others mm -hmm. that we don't even have time in order to live out our values. And uh, there's a great Warner Earhart quote that is fundamentally, I, I rediscovered it recently and it's just been like this, it's been, it's become a new part of my being. And Warner, right. as you know, was essentially the grandfather of large scale experiential trainings. So mm -hmm. he was the beginning of sort of these secular churches, you know, from, uh, from you know like what he did right. to Hoffman to Landmark to MKP to Tony Robbins to MITT to you know you name it Lifespring like it's all Warner he was an absolute genius and essentially one of the things that he said this quote is that when mm -hmm. I find myself constantly out of integrity it means that I've gotten a bit too big for myself and the thing about integrity is that it's a mountain with no top and I've always really kind of played around with the idea of how do I have my cake and eat it too? And the only way to have my mm -hmm. cake and eat it too is to eat it at the level that I'm at and not try to be above right. that because it's by being above it that I have to sacrifice 
the cake or having it or eating it. And to me, that's the exciting part is that we all have a compass. I've got a compass. You've got a compass. And the compass is, am I in integrity right now with my life? Like I said, I was going to do this. Am I doing all the things that I said I was going to do? Not just for other people, but for myself too. And when I'm not, then it means that something is completely out of alignment. When the preacher is giving a sermon about how it's so important to be the good Samaritan in life, and he's so busy and feels so rushed on the way to the mm-hmm. servants that he can't stop and help a person in need on the way exactly. and be the good Samaritan himself. Yeah. To me, that's a signal he's gotten a bit too big for exactly. himself and he's out you of know, it's, it's when those down. There's always time laws, to rebuild. those structures, those things that we justify as doing what we need to do, like getting to the church service or, or whatever, and leave those people on the side of the road, you know, really has me thinking. You know, you're going to a church service to worship a God who more than likely you believe is a loving God, yet you abandon a person to go praise a loving God. Mm. Bible's my mind. And then justify, well, it's important for me to be in this church service so that I can praise and worship God who tells me to go out and love people, but I just blew past somebody who needed my help. It, Bible's the mind. Mm, you know uh there's a yeah there's a there's a no, great no. idea like i spent by the way i hope that's not annoying if it is i'll, I'll ah, but um them. there's a, there's like a uh vacuum going over there but essentially <laughs> nice nice uh there's essentially i i was i was a radical atheist for years i've been i've been through every phase you can imagine and during my phase of radical atheism the little nugget that I didn't understand at the time was essentially mm-hmm. that most of the people that quote unquote spoke for God at that right. time um, couldn't speak for God any more <laughs> than they could speak for me. And just like if you have a horrible English or math teacher in high school, that'll shape your experience exactly. of the subject. English or math or history or whatever you want to say for the rest of your life. So too, the people that speak for religion and spirituality in our culture, mm-hmm. most of them are unqualified yeah. to do so. Now, you know, and I, I think you know, when you're <laughs> talking about you know, some of these stories life. within the Bible, when you look at some of the things that uh, you know Jesus had done to show you know the opposite, you know, like when he would heal somebody on the Sabbath and, and get in trouble for breaking a law. Yeah, the greater piece was healing somebody, you know. So, and, and to me, what always gets me in those things, not only do they try to go against him because, well, you broke a law, you're ignoring the fact that a person just healed physically another person. Like, like if I saw that, I'd be so amazed, I would forget what day of the week it was. Like, whoa, did I just see what I think I just saw? But they're so stuck in, in this formality and this legalistic, they even miss the fact that a person just healed another person. We, we can get so sidetracked on that. Mm, mm. <laughs> what is it? There, there's some Emerson quote. I'm going to put this. It's something like consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And what that means to me is that right. essentially this law, the yeah, formality exactly. that you speak of, makes it easy it makes it so people don't really need to think and the problem is is that is that i don't think any true religion is founded upon not thinking as much as a buddhist meditation teacher might say to you do not think do not think the point is not to not think the point is to be in control of your mind there's a great tony robin quote that i mm-hmm. love where it's like you know the secret to life is to use pain and pleasure and not right. to let pain and pleasure use you if you do that you're in control of life if you don't life controls you and i just think that like to me that's it's it's all the same idea like i remember alan watts talking about the void in mm-hmm. buddhism and saying that there's such like an eastern western semantic miscommunication between ideas because westerners right. take the void and they think to themselves there's this great abyss of death and it's just this nothingness container that we don't understand whereas the eastern understanding of that according to alan watts is just the plane of relativity like here's my ego self 
and here's all the relative space right. of who I could have become, yeah. become my potential, mm -hmm. and all oh, of that. Definitely. And the void is, is we all of this dealing stuff. and it's helping not nothing people else. to cope with things. And it is. That's one of the things that I think is important for people to see. We need to shift that perspective. We need to have people looking at themselves and the world around them different. We're stuck in some of these very legalistic, ritualistic ways without thinking beyond on the box to say else might be there what is this potential that maybe the rest of this stuff is bringing me down or holding me down exactly <laughs> i think we're doing great the because way, the topic I was a steamroller did you have an agenda with, or and can we get rid of suffering riffing and banter and i i think what we've been talking about really is that where, where, where have we, we we just automatically started going there because <laughs> to me you know in, in wow. looking at, at dealing with the sufferance the community and that change in perspective and uh you know how do we take care of self and and how does that just lead us you know away from that so i i think we're, we're right on topic as far as i'm concerned I'm, I think, mm -hmm. you know, can suffering cease to exist is such a compelling title because it implies so much. And I think that it needs to be unpacked a bit, meaning what does it oh, mean? We go what a lot of places philosophically on What does ceasing to exist mean? <laughs> because do we first have to define what does exist mean before we can look at ceasing to exist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's... You know, I, I think when you look wow. at suffering, wow. yeah. at least yeah, you you know, from my that? perspective, that we tend to view suffering because we do have a self-awareness. I think if you look at other creatures, they can have a knowledge of suffering based off of physical pain. So if they're being abused or hunted or, or whatever, that they can feel that suffering when they're captured. If they're hungry, they feel the hunger pains. I think as us who are self-aware of our existence, we notice in the self-awareness that there's more of a feeling and emotion of suffering and pain that doesn't have to be physical, where others lose that. So you know, I think when we look at this whole, you know, cease to exist and what is it to exist, the whole fact of how I view me in my existence is going to change my perspective of how I view suffering in my existence. If that makes sense. So I believe yeah, I fully in the quote, and, and I know this quote has been attributed really to that. many different people and books, so I won't attribute it, but I love the quote. We do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. And for me, that's very important in the sense that how I view me, my inner self, it is going to give me that experience of how I view the world around me. If I don't like me, the odds of me enjoying, finding pleasure in, beauty in, anything outside of me won't make sense. I can only see the world based off of the view of what's inside of me. Unless I'm allowing myself to be enlightened and open and, you know, taking in other things. But mm -hmm. I, I think many people, maybe even most, don't aim for that enlightenment. That's where they just kind of sit back and say, well, this is me. I don't like me. I hate everything out in the world. The world sucks. And that's just how it is. And nobody's going to tell me otherwise. Mm, wow. You brought up so many things that really resonate with me. My spiritual path all began with a book called Autobiography of a Yogi. So the term enlightenment has been something that I've struggled with for so many years. Right. And 
essentially when I began, it was this magical concept of, am I floating on air? <laughs> am I levitating yet? Am I able to, you know, kind of teleport across the planet? Mm -hmm. And it was a very magical thinking idea and concept. And it, that's, that's certainly matured a bit. Um, if I can say that, at least for myself, in terms of how I view the idea of enlightenment exactly. now in my life. And essentially, Immanuel Kant actually, um, during like the enlightenment era of the West said that enlightenment is having the courage to use your own reason. And it was like, wait, wow, that's fucking cool. Like very different than the Eastern magical type expression. Mm -hmm. And and I've come to see enlightenment now more as the ability in order to be self-determined. Right. And by that, what you were saying, instead of being the person to see the negativity, mm -hmm. being the person to see the positivity, because both equally exist and also understanding the gap in between, right? So responsibility is just that gap between awesome. stimulus and an action, which is your ability to respond. And as Viktor Frankl said in his Man's Search for Meaning, exactly. is that even in the most severe, austere conditions, we all have the ultimate freedom of choice. We always have that choice. It never leaves. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like what did Hamlet say, you know, exactly. put me in a nutshell and I'll call myself <laughs> king of the universe. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's always possible. And then to your point around, around viewing mm -hmm. sort of good and bad and, you know, how, how things resolve and perception and we see the world not as it is, but as we are. There's a story that's always stuck right. with me about that around essentially this king who had this advisor. And, he's, and the advisor always said, everything, it's all happening for the good. And so the king believed him, and the king was really excited about it. And one day they're out hunting, and the king falls off his horse and hurts his arm. And the advisor says, it's all happening for the good. <laughs> and the king goes, oh, okay, let me think about this. And after thinking about it for two seconds, he goes to the dungeon with you. There is nothing good about me falling down and injuring my arm. And sure enough, basically a little bit later, the king goes out and rides with his new huntsman and essentially they're captured by this group of cannibals in a nearby country. Um, I'm trying to think of Game of Thrones reference here, the Dothraki or whatever it is. And the cannibals are making a sacrifice to their god and they're saying, well, we must have a whole intact person. And mm -hmm. sure enough, they looked at the king and you know they saw his arm that was gimp and they said mm -mm, he's not he's not fit for our gods they cast them out they let him go and they take his huntsman and boom sacrifice him and he's gone sure enough the king comes running back and he's so excited i'm alive i'm alive and he goes and he finds his you know court uh, his advisor and he says you're not gonna believe it you're so right everything happens for the best i literally went to this thing all this stuff happened and i didn't get executed i didn't get cannibalized you're right oh my goodness i should have believed you but the one thing i don't understand is how is it for the best that you're here yeah, in exactly. prison for all that time? And the advisor looks to him and says, <laughs> who would have been your huntsman? And yeah. there are so many stories I've heard like that, but it all just exactly. goes to show like yeah. where and, and is the perspective the whole and thing your evaluation where I love that quote of because, whether or not an event was good you know, or bad. That's where I think when people look at you know the suffering and, and if you say, you know, well, can suffering ever cease to exist? I don't know if suffering can cease to exist, but the way that I perceive my suffering, that can cease. So if I can view myself as in the depths of suffering, my suffering can cease to exist if I change my mindset and perspective into I'm not in the depths of suffering. And, and like in that story, here's the positive outcome for why I'm here. I guess for me, in my worldview, Suffering has ceased to exist. You know, like, like you say, Viktor Frankl, you know, I, I mean, a good example when you talk about, you know, Nazi concentration camps and, you know, how do you find good out of that? How do you find people who can, you know, sit there and, and you know, not just, you know, wallow in all of that, but, you know, one of the things, and I forget where it is in his book where he talks about, you know, that they all look at this flower in the springtime breaking through the snow, you know, and, you know, yeah, and, and that's what they did. You know, they're all behind the fence. They, they know where they are, but for this moment of them mm, looking at that flower, beautiful. which happened to be on the other side of the fence, <laughs> kind of, you know, hurting them even more, but 
they can still look at that and see the beauty in that and see the newness and, and the new life. And, and for that moment, you could suspend that reality of where am I w without denying where you are, but I'm able for that moment in that beauty and that newness mm. not to be present in that camp. I, I would think in that moment, suffering can cease. Wow. Wow. I, by the way, that gave me the chills everywhere in my body because mm -hmm. there's a lesson that's come to me very strongly recently, and it's all about expectations. It's all about expectations. And, uh, and I think that, mm. you know, it's, it's funny. I made, a, I made a joke the other day of like, you know, like a new set of four noble truths. And essentially to me, it's like life is about, or like problems are all about integrity and expectations. Because if I have an expectation that I, that I should be or do something and I'm confronted against a different reality, to me, that's the genesis of suffering where I think I'm one thing, reality is another thing. And I am just totally raging at the gap in between. And I think that mm -hmm. if I, if I enter into a situation without any expectation for what else it could be, it's like, it can all be beautiful. Do you know what I mean? It can all be beautiful. And, and the mistake that I make, and I make it all the time, and it's certainly hubris and ego and my own hum lack of humility that gets in the way, is, is I believe like the two secrets to getting anything you want is creating exactly what you want, like having the vision for exactly what it is that you want. And then the second is starting exactly where you're at. <laughs> and the problem with that is that I, for one, I'm usually not not humble enough in order to start exactly where I'm at. I want to start five paces ahead of where I'm at. And that's what generates and, and all the suffering in my life. It's just not accepting exactly where I'm at and loving that process. You know, who am I at this present moment? And, you know, a lot of what I do in, in my writings and, and my private practice and all this is on mindfulness and, and that whole point of staying in this moment really exactly what you were saying. The more that I can stay in this moment and accept who I am with all my faults, all my failings, and all of the great things about me, then I can do the best good. But like you say, I, I, I shoot ahead of myself. Well, that five steps or so ahead of myself is not in this present moment. I can't do that. I, I can't teleport to the future <laughs> and jump those steps. And then I wish I could. So you're right. I mean, that's where the suffering is because now I'm anxious. I'm stressed. I, I'm, you know, and then beginning to doubt myself, you know, so if, if I can't do these, you know, so many steps ahead and I can't, then I might as well throw it all up because I, I just can't do any of it. You know, and then this was never meant for me. And then you get all this negative self-talk. So it's so important to yeah, live in that moment and say, this is who I am and this is what I can do right now. And who knows where it's going to take me yeah. to the next step? Because maybe that next step that, that, and I'm similar in you in the sense that I've planned out my next couple steps, but how do I know that next step is really the next step? You know, I don't know who I'm going to encounter, what experience I'm going to have that might signal to me, you know what, here's really your next step. And it had nothing to do with what I thought my next step was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, if you're not, if you're not open to that, mm -hmm. and if I'm not open to that, then that exactly. Exactly. rainbow bridge. And, and we're not going to be open to that if we're not living in that moment, if dissolves. we're not accepting of who we are. And that's, again, where I think that suffering can cease. You know, so it's not so much saying, you know, can suffering in the world in general cease? No, I'm going to feel pain. I'm, I'm going to feel emotional pain, physical pain. It's going to happen. But if it happens in the present moment and I can accept that it's happening and that I can move forward in the doing, you know, like you're saying with the story with, with the king and the huntsman, you know, if I can look at it from a whole different perspective, I can say this suffering has some meaning somewhere and I need to sit with it to find that meaning. It's going to be a life lesson for me if I sit with it. Mm. 
Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think what's fascinating to me to kind of bring it full circle back to what you were saying in terms of, in terms of why do people have these flash pan moments of lucidity and then essentially dissolve back into the inertia of their lives. Mm -hmm. And to me, it all comes down to their paradigm and their framework and how they see themselves and how they're educated. And, and what I get from what you're saying is that you're somebody who places a large amount of value mm -hmm. on self-reflection and self-growth and, in truly looking at yourself, even when it's hard, in order to see what you can learn from it. And I think that if we just think about like the industrial age type education system that exists in America today, it wasn't geared for independent creative problem solving. It was geared towards mechanization. It was geared towards the problems of an industrial age. And the yes, moment we that we value entrepreneurship and critical thinking. Um, oh, we got a question. That's exciting. Wow. Um, is it accurate? Well, I guess my, I'm going with the flow here. Is it accurate uh, to that, That's why I, I hated to interrupt, but I had to throw it up uh, uh, on the screen here. That is such a good um, question. Well, somebody had asked it, so I was able to click there and, and put it on so that all of us could see it. And, oh, you uh, threw it up? That's great. Yeah, is it accurate to equate anxiety with suffering? Wow. Yep. Uh, by the way, so like, here's where my transformation mode comes in. And instantly, the first thing <laughs> that I think is that the very asking of the question itself belies not necessarily the answer, but the fact that you'd be suffering. And the thing is, is that is that just like can suffering cease to exist, can become an overwhelming, obsessive question where the very person who just consistently and earnestly asks it is probably the very person most in the throes of, of the consequence of it. I think that the real secret is, is that yeah. anxiety is yeah. only suffering when Mm -hmm. when it bothers you. <laughs> well, I think in some ways, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but it, it goes back to the expectation. You know, what, what is my expectation in life? You know, and I, I would tend to think, I mean, I don't like to make generalizations of, ever, of anything. So my first response to that question would be, well, it's accurate in some cases, not accurate in others, only because I don't want to say, yes, every anxiety is equated to suffering. Um, but I, I think on, on that deeper level it is those expectations, you know, that do I view anxiety as a negative for one? And what is my expectation in life? You know, is it that if I do certain things, I'm going to not have anxiety? And then I get messed up when I still have anxiety, you know, so. Hmm. Yeah. And, and by the way, it's, it's, you know, right. the more you resist, so the more you try to go, I don't want to feel anxious, I don't want to feel anxious, the more, you know, anxious. know, so that, that I think, you know, we, we need to look <laughs> at it as well in the answer to the question, but it brings up a, a story that I remember in a book called, I don't think I remember the author of it. it. It's a book published a few decades ago. Um, and uh, it was called Mosquitoes in Paradise. Um, get the name of the author, <laughs> but mm. his premise was so because they the are there. Story right? of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden before the fall was supposed to be this place of entire peacefulness and happiness, and it's paradise. And we would then equate paradise with the lack of suffering, anxiety, pain. So his question was, in paradise, in the garden, if there were mosquitoes and a mosquito ended up sucking the blood out of Adam or Eve, would it itch? 
And, and actually, way, that's, my, that's where he goes with the book. Answer is that yes. even in paradise, A yes, lot. it would itch. <laughs> Why? Because the mosquito is being true to itself. The mosquito is being the mosquito. The mosquito needs our blood to fertilize the eggs and all of that. And our body is being true to itself. Our body produces those antibodies or whatever it is to you know, fight against the disease or whatever. So in our bodies doing what it does, and in the mosquito acting the way it's meant to act, yes, even in paradise, there's going to be a level of suffering and pain. The way that I think about it is in terms of games. And I think that one of the greatest fallacies, and I think I, I consider it actually a fundamental human attribution error, fundamental human heuristic, fundamental human illusion fallacy. Meaning I could almost talk to every, almost ask anybody this or talk to them and they probably have this fallacy that they desire that that the desire for the end of a pain and suffering and challenges is, yeah. is a good thing and so human beings are fascinated and just intrigued and desperate for utopias mm -hmm. and essentially utopia is a place of complete and utter homogeny all needs are met it's just this wonderful wonderful experience but yeah. the problem with it is that it actually is a reductio ad absurdum yeah. Because if you take away all the pain and the suffering and the challenges of life, you also take away all the joy. Because that is duality. Mm -hmm. Like the only way I can experience a joy and uplifting experience is to have contrast. And like a stupid toy example of this is I remember when I had a yoga teacher, one of my, one of my main yoga teachers, uh, I was actually in India with them and I was like, looking at them doing forward bends. And I, I said, mm -hmm. I, and I was doing a forward bend and I could touch my toes, but I couldn't put my hands completely underneath my feet. And I said, oh, I'm so jealous. Like I want to just get right there to the point of being able to be perfectly flexible like you are. And they stopped me and they said, no, enjoy the stretch because eventually it goes away. And ever since then, it's just like, anytime I have an exercise for a while and I'm going down and it's like, mm -hmm. that, my hands, like it's, I'm starting to feel mm -hmm. the stretch by my ankles. I'm like, yes, because the stretch is the juiciness. It's what lets me know I'm alive. And without it, there's no room to grow. Exactly. Without it, there's no possibility. It's <laughs> no like fun, playing you know? capture the I mean, flag or tag there or is, football and, without and that's an why I like in that book too. Because, you know, I think when we put up this title, you know, of, of you know, can suffering cease to exist? In, in our perceptions and ourselves, I say totally yes. But are we going to be devoid of, of that suffering? No. And as you're pointing out, I would agree. Nor should we. To me, when we do suffer or when we have anxieties or, or however that translates for ourselves, what is that learning potential? What is that growth potential for us? So if we don't have those, we're not going to grow. We're, we're going to stay at, at these very immature beings because we haven't been challenged. You know, and, and I, I think we do see that in the animal world. You know, again, I don't think they suffer in the way we do, but what helps the animals to grow into who they are is they challenge themselves. You know, you, you see, you know, bear cubs and all, you know, are, are fighting and the males will fight with the other males and all. They're challenging each other to get yeah. better. Without it, they're going to starve without knowing how to fight and kill and, and do what they do. So they have to struggle with that. Yeah. And I think that's how that yeah. translates to us. You know, if we avoid all suffering, all pain, all anxiety, all, how, how does one grow? Yep. We don't. It's just some people have bought into the illusion that they're not supposed to feel that way. I mean, I, like I think about my own life and I think about all the situations where, where like I had a little pain, um, like for example, I remember like I went I went surfing uh, in Hawaii years and years ago. I must have been really young, 
and and I was I was going down, and this uh, this other surfer hit me with his board in the side, and I had like such a pain in my side, and I was so <laughs> damaged, oh, it was so horrible, until I went to go see the doctor, and the doctor was like, nah, it's nothing, <laughs> no big deal. Exactly. All <laughs> and like instantly, I was like, oh, I feel so much better now. <laughs> and the thing is, is that. Right, right. Where it's like, you know, of course mm -hmm. you're going to suffer if you're if you don't think that you should feel that way. You know, if you think that some if, if there's a mismatch of expectations and and I think that like I am experiencing a tremendous amount of pain that is unusual and it's damaging. Mm -hmm. and I mean, evolutionarily, it makes sense that I would freak out about that because it would mean that death is coming. It's just yeah. we live in different times. I mean, death in the 21st century comes from. No, random accidents, exactly. like very rarely you know, and, from you know, and things that that's where can, I do you know, worry about society prepared. in general <laughs> in the sense of not being introspective, deeper thinkers in the sense that, um, you know, when, when you notice that we avoid all suffering and we take pills for everything, that's why we have no reason to be introspective. It appears that unfortunate. Oh, are you still there? Okay, I lost seeing you, but I can hear yes, you. Yes. So, oh, I'm I'm hearing you. I, I just oh, don't see you. So, as long as you're hearing me and I'm hearing you, we're good. But and by the way, um, what was uh, what was the timing on this? Because <laughs> I might have to go in a minute. I don't know if we I, had I'm the flexible, full hour you know, or if it was thirty. Expectations. Minutes. I have no huge expectations here. Um, <laughs> it's ten minutes, and we just um, kept going. So yeah, I mean, if if you know, we can look at wrapping up. You know, do you have some? Oh, you're back. I can see you again. Um, <laughs> so. Why don't we do that? Uh, you know, what would be some of your kind of wrap up for this? You know, when we look at this whole topic and, and what's going on, um, how, how would you summarize it all? So, so I very intentionally called this organization that I'm working on Integral Fitness because I wanted people to have a more empowering salutogenic view mm -hmm. on their lives and mental health and how they grow and how they can expand. And I think that we've grown up around a essentially pathogenic and even spiritual or mysterious view of mental health and emotional health where there's some, you know, geist in our head and we don't know how that works. And some days it's on and some days it's off and we just can't really have any control over it. And then eventually when it gets bad enough, mm -hmm. we go to see a counselor or a therapist or we take a pill and like, you know, that'll solve it. And instead the model that makes most sense to me is, is a model of, of exercise, a model of fitness where there's work I can do in order to sculpt shape and grow these parts of myself. And, it's a really simple image. And the image is that when I essentially lift a weight in my right arm and I do a bicep curl, I'm essentially making, you know, um, myofractal, whatever mm -hmm. it is, I'm, I'm making little tears in my muscles that essentially rewire and grow back together in a way that's stronger. And similarly, every time I have a thought, every time I make a new connection, there is a similar analogous process happening in my brain. My hippocampus is essentially retrieving and acting as a signal board for different neural pathways in order to essentially mm -hmm. create the representation, like literally the presentation in the present moment of something that might have happened a long time ago. And that is either reinforced or it's exactly. extinguished through repetition. <laughs> and either a new neural pathway mm -hmm. is strengthened and developed or it's not. And I really, my, the most important message that I want to get out is that I live in a I live in a generation I'm part of a generation that is really excited about changing the world and in doing so no one's really right. so focused on changing themselves but it's not possible to have world change if the same people who are stepping up as leaders 
are as wounded as the leaders of the past, albeit in just a few slightly different ways. You know, they're not wounded like their parents, but they're wounded in the opposite way, which just recreates the same general issue. And to me, it all starts from within. And I think that to empower people with the idea that they can take charge of their lives and they can take charge of their emotions, they can take charge of whether or not they're suffering or they're enjoying life, not because mm -hmm. it's an easy, instant process where all of a sudden they're going to listen to this, they're going to hear our voices and just wake up instantly and say, I'm enlightened, tomorrow I'll have a giddy day, and for the rest of their life, it's sunny. It's not. We've already said mm -hmm. that. It's dark and it's raining. Exactly. And you get stung by <laughs> mosquitoes and you get thrown <laughs> off of ships because there's a hurricane and eaten by whales. It all happens. And the thing is, is that the point is not to be essentially victim in the vicissitudes of life. The point is to essentially rise above it and to continue strengthening yourself in who you're becoming. And that to me is just like, fuck, like, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the more people that get that, because I get oh, it, yeah. but I'm like, I'm like this, do you know what I mean? Like the amount of talent I have is like, is actually not high. I see talented people all the time. And I go, if you mm -hmm. guys only woke up, if you only understood the power that you have within you, your potential energy that if you just put into motion, it would become kinetic immediately. And you'd be able to enact so much of what's within you. And literally not just create mm -hmm. what like create your vision oh, yeah. but also affect so many people's lives i mean imagine what the oh, world man, would be. that to me is so exciting it's just so exciting yeah yeah i'm 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 in i mean that to me that to me is it and you know just the idea that just just the idea that like you know someone someone's gonna wake up you know and maybe listen to this and this starts a path where you know you and i don't don't hear or see from them again for 40 years, but but there was just one little thing that we said that wasn't even the most important thing that we think we said. It just was a shard, a ricochet, collateral piece of our exchange that lodges into their soul or their belly, their heart, their mind, and leads towards profound yeah. impacts on their life and others. I, I, mean, I totally agree like and, and appreciate the humility blast. <laughs> because we need the humility blast too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah no that all of that makes so much sense and and if people can you know even just begin to reach that potential our world is going to be such a different place and and i know it's out there it's just how do we get the right people to get the right messages and and to really start to listen and act and do the right it, it's it's going to be awesome but I think I think it's it's this though. I mean, look, like we we might have only had I think on this corner. I said I, I saw three viewers, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just say it was zero. Let's just say it was you and I. We made exactly. an effort. We put something out there, and the result of that doesn't even matter because if more people were willing to step up mm -hmm. for good, power, powerful, empowering things, I mean, there's just there's a great poem that I love, and and I think. This I'll, I'll end on this one and then I'll shut up because I'll just ramble forever. And it's just like, it's always stuck with me. It's, it's Yeats, you know, you get that Irishman poetry and it goes turning and turning in the widening gyre, turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned, drowned. The best lack all conviction. The best lack all conviction. Well, the worst are filled with passionate intensity. That's the line to really think about. The best lack all conviction. Well, the worst are filled with passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are the words out when some vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of a desert, a figure with lion body and the head of a man is reeling its slow thighs while all about him real shadows of the indignant birds. The darkness drop ag drops again. And, and now I know, now I know that 20 centuries <laughs> of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare. And what rough creature it's hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be Awfully born. powerful. <laughs> But, and, and so true, and, and the only thing that kind of puts me down on that is, is that line for us to focus on, I think is happening today. 
you know, the, the good people are not right now the passionate, convicted ones to go out and make that difference. And we sit back and allow the others to have that passion and do it and then complain and complaining gets us nowhere. Yeah, we need to all hear that poem and, and find that passion and beat their passion. Our passion's going to win if we use it. Yes. We're sitting back. Yes. And and it's precisely because the good people feel like them speaking up contributes more to the chaos, and so they stifle themselves. Yeah. And to me, that's the greatest tragedy. Because the good is always going to triumph. <laughs> and if the if so many of the good would take that risk, yeah, we're going to go above the cacophony of all that negative. It's not going to add to it. It's going to overpower it. We just have to take the risk. Amen. It's been a wonderful talk. I'm in and I'm out with that. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate this. Um, you want to give out some contact info for people who uh, you know, may want to get in touch with you and learn more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, I would say go to integralfitness.org, I N T E G R A L F I T N E S S dot O R G. And everything should be on there. And I think that we're we're a fledgling movement and it only works through word of mouth of people stepping up and taking charge of, of themselves and taking initiative. And I'm just excited to continue to see it grow and to, and to see people really not join us, but essentially mm -hmm. step up <laughs> for what needs to happen anyways. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And, and I really thank you for, you know, uh, really setting the stage for this dialogue, and it was it was Same. such a pleasure. And to I hope speak. we can do it again. And I will be promoting your site. And we need more people to to step up and and do the good. So, thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. This has been great, and I look forward to more in the future. Yeah. All right. Yay! Awesome. Have a great evening. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.